snow, a little bit of freezing rain today. Uh, just been a nice day, of course we have. As we come to um, Revelation 14, um, just want to cover a, really a, a couple things. Um, in dealing with God's final warning and, and the angels uh, are preaching here in Revelation 14, 1 through 8, um, we talked about uh, the last time about one of the darkest pages um, in the Bible. Uh, we talked about the two godless men, uh, the dictator of the revived Roman Empire and the dictator of Palestine, or many times you will hear him as the false prophet. These two men are the most evil men uh, in world history. They they will wear they wear two hats. I put war, but they wear two hats. One is political and one is religion. We talked about how you mix that together. Uh, that uh, they are instruments of really of Satan. Satan possesses the dictator of the Roman Empire, and Satan himself, not not a demon, uh, not one of his demons, the uh, Satan himself. They said and did whatever Satan wanted them to do. Um, both of them, like I say, demon possessed, the Antichrist by Satan himself. We talked about the number of six six six. I did a little bit about numbers, not inclusive, just just a little bit about them the last time. Uh, and we talked about that dark numbers and. Then the number seven is the perfect number, the number of deity, and six is short of perfection, short of deity. Uh, the number of a person or a man, and a man cannot can never uh, be perfect till we get to heaven. The number seven, um, we will finally be perfect, perfect one day when we get there. I guess you could say we're going to be the complete number seven. Uh, but right now, I guess you could say we're all the number six. But anyway. These two men are trying to um, take the world. They're trying to rule the entire world, a little bit different than some of the other ones. But that's what they're going to do. Um, and there's there's a couple things that um, I think I may have mentioned earlier in some of these studies. But uh, in a website, raptureready.com, they give some things that are quoted from them about what's happening in the world today that we see going on that, that really apply and when you study this book it kind of puts some sense in, into some of the things we're hearing uh, through these things you know um, Revelation is not a topical study it, it, it's a study of the, uh, of the book of Revelation yeah it is uh, prophetic and it's a prophetic uh, message it's not a prophetic ministry and like most of us like me that were called to preach we preach the whole word of God not we may do topical sermons uh, for different things, but when you're studying a complete book, even though it deals with a specific topic like prophecy, it doesn't mean that we're called to do that specific thing. We're just called to preach God's Word. And so some of that comes out, and we have prophetic ministries and things like that, but you know, all preachers are called to do the complete Word of God. And when we don't, we're actually disobeying God. If we stay away from the book of Revelation, if we stay away from what's going on in the world today, early pastors in the United States, if you go back and check, they preached on things that were happening in the world. They would pick newspaper headlines and they would preach on them. So sometimes we uh, in, in, the, in the church or don't want to do, do that. that. We kind of want to uh, not get into Revelation. We're scared of it or afraid to make a stand in it. Uh, but I think it's thing, if we're going to be a warning, as I said here, God's final warning, one of the things preachers and Actually, Christians were called to warn people, let people know what's going on, look up, open your eyes, see what's happening, be ready. The redemptive message of God goes from Genesis to Revelation. Now, God, I'm going to mention here, he's going to use fear, he's going to use everything he can. We're seeing the grace of God in, in this chapter and a few things uh, all the way through Revelation. It's a time, it's a warning, it's a time, you know, warning he's coming, uh, salvation is going to end, I'm coming back, and it's all over. And he sets up the millennial kingdom. So, the redemptive plan of God is in every book of the Bible, from the beginning to end, always there. And so that's always foremost in what we have and what we teach. So here's some things from this, uh, from that website, theraptureready.com. These are quotes from people uh, called globalists, uh, globally, the uh, shadow government and various other names want to create 
and run a new world order. We know that's coming. We talk about the new world order. We've been hearing that way back when Clinton was around. Uh, maybe even the first Bush talking about uh, the new world order. And we um, need to uh, uh, remember that. And that, that's nothing new, but that's what they're trying. A new world order implies uh, the demise of the, of the current, current world order, um, especially when it deals with the United States here, where we are prophecy, we don't know. But that's what it's dealing with. Now, the slogan of many globalists, including the new administration that's coming in, uh, the UN, the Pope, and Fran uh, Pope Francis, is is build back better. And, and these, these are quotes. This is not from me. This, this is a quote from here, build back better. But to build back better, what does it mean? The current world order must be destroyed or changed uh, first. Build back better implies uh, a better world. Uh, globalists are trying to gain total control. The Bill Gates of this world, the guy in Germany, France, all these, all these power guys that come with the elite, the money guys are involved in all this as they meet in this. Um, and, and you can go out. It, it's not hidden. Um, you know, the uh, World Economic Forum, that's what it's called. Go out to the website. If they haven't taken it down, you can you can see what they, what they want to do. Um, and this one, Bill Back Battery Globus, are trying to gain control of the world on every, everyone on the earth. Our religious system, our political system, and our economic system. There are, are three pillars there, the economics, the political, and religious part. That's that's the three wood that's the that's three pillars that they build on. Uh, what we buy, what we sell, what we say, and we're seeing a lot of that today. What's going on is is is, is this stagnation is the deletion of free speech. We see that going on. Uh, th this video may not stay up there. I don't know. What we say, what we own, what we, where we live, where we work, and who we worship, and of course, a lot more. Now, we talked about the mark of the beast last time, and what that could be, and how this virus could be part of that, uh, the card for that. Um, things that we won't get on the airlines. The airlines may do it, they may not put it, but the airlines, businesses, and things like that may cause us to prove that we've taken that shot. And they were they were seeking global power to bring about the new world order through um, Davos, uh, uh, a great reset they call it, the World Bank, the IMF, the G7, the G20 meetings. They're all designed to do that. Notice here's another quote from them. Notice that all of these meetings are gatherings of the elite globalists, uh, not the gatherings of the people that have been elected by ordinary citizens. Uh, at two meetings in 2019, the UN and the World Economic Forum, as I said, President Trump said the future does not belong to the globalists, but to the patriots. He is a stumbling block for it. They say Trump's patriotism and nationalism are in direct opposition to the new world globalism. Now, he says he may be wrong. If we're wrong, um, then we'll just ask God for forgiveness of that and just go on. But in... Uh, I sent a link out earlier about this, and, and they want to merge us, um, uh, fusion us, physically, uh, digitally, and biologically, identification. Uh, by 2030, they want a great reset, they call it. They, they talk into the video that they want to do it. And this is not, um, I'm, I'm not theorizing, um, I, this is fact. Does that you can go out to their site? Like I say, don't believe me. Go out to the site, see that, and you'll see the uh, economical and, and political and religious. And we talked about the Antichrist headquarters, the two at the political and the religious side. So, see, this they throw a little moral in there that you have to wear the mask for your neighbor, take a shot for your neighbor. All this kind of sounds good, so they throw that moral in there, and you see how they throw um, all of that. It's a fourth industrial system where. Uh, machines do a lot. We've got machines doing that now. Um, Billy Crone out of Arizona, he has things that he can show you where he's made these robots and all that, and we're using things like that today. And so it, it, it's not a conspiracy. It, it, it's, it's out there. It's a fact. I thought I'd just throw in there before we uh, try to do this. And a lot of people say, uh, these men are trying to take over. The people say, well, where's God? that's been going on here. Well, where, where's God? Where's the answer to this? Why is this happening? What is God doing at this time? Well, 
Um, you know, every time we have a war that breaks out and, and we say, well, where is God? Why doesn't God stop it? Why didn't God stop this? God didn't start it in the first place. So where was God when when these two men come on the scene? Where have we seen God and in, in what's been going on in our society? The dictator revived Roman Empire. We're talking here. Uh, was trying to take over the world and the dictator of Palestine was trying to defeat God any way he can. Well, that's why we have chapter 14. What is God doing? E even today, what is God doing? Well, um, besides this, we have chapter 14. God is still in control. Don't give up. Don't fret. God is still in control. God's plan is going to go through to its end. We may li like to see what we're seeing today um, as believers um, and maybe even veterans like me, war veterans like me, we don't like to see what's what's happening. We have supported our country. Many men and women have given their lives for this country. We don't like to see it, but God is still in control. He hasn't given up. So don't give up on, on that. Sometimes we, as Christians, uh, kind of give people, I don't want to say a false hope, um, that this world's going to get better. It isn't going to get better. I, I'm not saying we're not going to go through trials. Some of us are going to go through trials. Maybe the rapture is going to come, and, and I believe the rapture is going to take us out of the tribulation period. Period, But that doesn't mean we're not going to go through some things now. We want Christ to come back. We want the new world. We want to be with him. We want him to set up the money and kingdom. We want to live forever. But to do that, some things have to happen. And sometimes we give this, oh, if we all pray, if we all do this, we'll all get together that God's going to change. And God's plans aren't going to change. I can't remember the king or whatever that wanted more years. God gave him 15 years and they were horrible. So we may not want God's time to be extended when he's going to come back or start the last seven years of this world. So we have to keep that in mind. We have to watch what kind of hope we're giving because we staple on that just like this Trump thing. People are hanging on to a thread. We are hanging in there because we didn't want to see our country go down. And so we have to see that same thing. We don't want to have to face trials. We don't want it. So sometimes we are hanging on and we, we, we get this kind of false hope. We need to still live in reality and that God's plan is there. And the Bible tells us that things aren't getting better. There are some churches who are going to tell you things are getting better, but they're not. They're not going to. It depends on your, uh, your view of things. And that's part of the problem is sometimes we don't. We try to fit everything into our theology anyway. So we have chapter 14. We, chapter 14 is the other side of the coin. Uh, what was God doing while these dictators were trying to destroy earth? He was moving in power to do something great. He still is. God was building his perfect kingdom. He is still doing that. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and this is going to end. He's still building his kingdom. And that is chapter That is chapter 14. is is about. Uh, when the devil was doing his worst, God was doing his best. And that's chapter 14. Uh, in chapter 13, we have the counterfeit religion. Chapter 14, <clears throat> we have the uh, perfect and the truth. In chapter 13, we have the beast. In chapter 14, we have the Lamb of God. In chapter 13, we have the mark of the beast. In chapter 14, we have the mark of God on the souls of 144,000 and those who are saved during that period too, not just them. Chapter 13, we had the worship of idolatry. Chapter 14, the worship of the true God. <coughs> Chapter 13, we have Satan's um, awful kingdom. If you get kingdom and followers. And chapter 14, we have God's kingdom of the redeemed established to the millennial period. Chapter 13, we have the number 666 and evil. Chapter 14, we have the 144,000 sealed, saved by God. Chapter 13, we have Satan at work. Chapter 14, God is at work. You see, we have a coin. One side, we have evil. Chapter 13, darkest, one of the darkest pages in the Bible. And on the other side, we have chapter 14, God at work. Now, in verse 1 in chapter 14, it says, And I looked, and behold... I looked and and I looked and lo, a lamb. I said, "Behold, a lamb stood on on Mount Zion." Now, okay. Now, Mount Zion um, is we seen uh, not not the mount in, in Jerusalem in the Jerusalem city where David built his stronghold, but this is this is the heavenly Mount Zion. Um, the hundred forty four thousand. Are in heaven with us, for the twenty-four elders, for they all redeemed. They are with us. 
um, and who are they? Well, we met them, really. I mean, it, somebody said, well, who are they? Well, if you go back to chapter 7, um, it, it's going to tell us um, <clears throat> in 1 through 4, and after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding, and we've talked about this, so four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on the trees. And I saw another same kind, alas, angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the, neither the sea, nor the trees, till I have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were <coughs> sealed, were sealed, a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes. Of Israel. We, we know who they are. These are the tribes of Israel. The tribe of Dan is not here because the tribe of Dan, we believe the anti, the false prophet is coming from, the dictator of the Roman Empire. And we see these are who they are. Um, they are saved by God. Now you remember, when, when you are saved, God puts a seal on you. You read in Romans, we are sealed, bring a promise, sealed by the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit seals us all. And we are sealed by that, by that Spirit. And Satan can never break that seal. He doesn't have the power to break that seal. Neither do we, uh, once we are saved. And the problem is, are we really saved or not? Uh, but it cannot be broken. He can get you out of fellowship with God, but he can never break that seal around you that God sealed us with. So God is going to seal those 144,000 Jews, Jewish evangelists, from every tribe. Now, tribulation is going, <clears throat> is going to last seven years. Three and a half is a great tribulation. Tribulation, three and a half is a great tribulation. Uh, the last three and a half. Um, when the two dictators make their pact at the beginning of the tribulation, God is going to seal 144,000. There's no reason for the church. As I keep saying logically, there's no reason if God is going to bring this, and we're going to talk about the angels in a minute. All of these people, the church is not here. <coughs> the Holy Spirit is taken out. Who we talked about in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 2. <coughs> we're part of the Holy Spirit, the church. We're gone. And he seals these 144,000 uh, <coughs> Jewish evangelists <coughs> at the beginning of the tribulation. <coughs> they will preach for seven years. The worst time in world history, I know some people say the first half isn't as bad as the second half, which is true. That's why they call the second half the Great Tribulation. Uh, <coughs> tribulation. <coughs> Excuse me, it always happens when I start talking about Satan and stuff. But, okay. The 145, they will preach seven years. The worst time. Now look, when it comes to the end, they're still here. Did you notice that? 144,000. Nobody was able to kill them because God sealed them. So I said, when you are saved, you are sealed by God forever, for all eternity. They started at the beginning. Here they are on Mount Zion in Israel. They are still 144,000. None of them died because God is sealed. Now, is that hard to believe? No. Look what God did with Israel during Egypt's time. Didn't he protect them? All those plagues didn't go against Israel. Only went against the Egyptians. What's so hard to believe? How big is your God? Can he do anything? Yes. Okay. So we see that, and they're sealed, and they're here. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go in and do anything once you're sealed, once you're saved. That doesn't give you a license just to go. If you continue to do that, and you walk and walk and walk and walk away from God, you may end up doing it. We talked about earlier, the sin and the death. God says, you're a reprobate, takes you home. Okay. You know that if you, um, you're going to pay. You're going to pay. If you walk away from God, you're going to pay with uh, disciplines. You're going to experience tough times. God does that. Uh, turns you around if you're not with him. The devil, But the devil cannot break that seal. It is one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible. You see in chapter, in chapter 7, we see them in the beginning of the 144,000 tribulation. And in chapter 14, you see them at the end. Now remember, Revelation isn't in a chronological order. Chapter 6 is a summary. Then you have the, the seals of trumpets for the, or against the Gentiles. Then you have the bowls and the vials which are against the Jews. And the other chapters, 8 through 11, 11 through 19, against the Jews. If I'm remembering right and all I have, uh, we do. <clears throat> now, 
God protects them. And in chapter 14, you see them at the end, as I said, God protects them for God's glory. And we will see them. Because we're in heaven. So we're going to see them. Now, every Jew alive then will be saved. Um, that is, sometimes people want to say in replacement theology, which I do not believe in, and I know it isn't any good. But let me give you an example. Let's read, we're going to read a couple of passages here. In Romans chapter 11, verses, uh, what is it, um, 25 through 27, God is not done with Israel. This is this is the restoration of Israel in Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye, or church age uh, ends, should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. See that blindness in part. When or until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. In other words, when the, when the time of the Gentiles is over, which that is going to start uh, in the tribulation period and towards the end, and they're going to see him, all this is going to take place. Um, don't be proud about yourselves that you're, you're, you're in the church age. God has not forgotten them. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverance shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them which I have taken away their sin. God doesn't go back on his covenants. God has promised Israel the land. He's promised an unconditional covenant. And God does not go back on it. And this happens at, after the rapture of the church. This takes place. And the time of the Jew is given back to them. I promised them 490 years. I owe them seven years. I'm giving it back because God has to do that. So God is going to take away the negative volition in their lives. And, of course, you, you can read you know, Isaiah 66. But there's just a couple... Um, I'm going to go back to Isaiah 66. And I just, just, um, I know, I know it's 66, Isaiah 10. Um, 10, starting at verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant, the remnant in that day, from the end, of Israel, such as are escaped from the house of Jacob, shall no more again stray upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For through thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. Now, we're not saying all of Israel. There's a, there's a remnant. Remember, there's a lot of people in Israeli descent that, that have died without Christ. Okay? Uh, the people who the sand of the sea, talking about them, yet a remnant of them shall be saved and shall return to the... Uh, Consumption discreet shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. <clears throat> God is going to say there's going to be a remnant saved of, of Israel. Um, now there's there's going to be thousands and thousands of killed, but they're going to believe like like in a day they're going to come. Um, Zechariah, I think, is another. Good one, Zechariah um, 10, 9 and 10. It says, And I will now, uh, no, I will sow them, excuse me, among the people, and they shall remember me in the far countries, and they shall live with their children and turn again. And I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and and place shall be found for and a place shall be found for them. So we see that Israel's going to come back. God's going to watch over them. They're going to bring that bring that uh, back. Uh, so we have um, millions and millions will be killed. Some will die of starvation during the tribulation period. Millions will be saved, but some will be there. And like I say, you have four uh, that talks about it, and then you get the list of tribes five through eight. Look at verse nine. And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white, rank, white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which, say, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Now, 
And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces. We've, talk, we've done this before. And worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might the crescendo about God. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, though thou knowest, and he said to me, These are which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, in the, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, these, these are the these are the tribulation saints. The difference you don't hear about church age saints, you hear tribulation saints. You don't get the saints mixed up. Okay, there's a church age saints which talks about it. We're priests and kings. And we're the bride of Christ, and most of the times the bride of Christ were the saints, but these are the tribulation saints. And a saint is nothing but one who's followed Christ, been set aside. And so these are the ones that are saved from the preaching of the 144,000, Moses, Elijah, and the angels. This is them are there. That's who they are. They're identified. We, we don't have to really worry about where they come from. And, and God even um, even prayed, uh, prayed for them uh, these seven years. Jesus prayed. Um, oh, let's see. John... Oh, John, in, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, um, in, in John 17. Now, this is high, this is his prayer, okay. <clears throat> in, seven, in John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, talking about Satan, uh, and Ju um, Judas, uh, none of it from that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus isn't going to lose anyone. He doesn't. He's God. He's not going to lose anyone. He's going to protect protect them. Um, so in, in addition to the church age saints, we have the 144,000 Jewish evangelists and all of those that are saved during during that uh, tribulation period to come out of the great tribulation. You just saw that. Okay, they're going to be there. And you read more, not, like I say, Isaiah 66, you can go back to but that's what happens. Salvation has come. They're white robes of salvation. See, God's salvation plan is still in the book of Revelation. It hasn't gone away. It's still there in the book of Revelation. Now, again, uh, let's go back to uh, verse 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb, Christ, stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their forehead sealed saved uh there again stood uh perfect tense uh he's standing in his resurrected body when we see christ we are going to see him in his resurrected body i know i use that big word i'm not going to use it again so I understand it again. but that's where he is that's who we're going to see it's god's spirit we're going to see him with the marks and that comes later when you get your resurrected body folks no sin is going to be able to touch you Again, it isn't, going to, isn't that great? We're finally going to reach perfection, per se. No sin, no temptation is going to bother us. We, it just isn't going to touch us. We finally lose the old sin nature, and we have our resurrected bodies. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, majestic music. Oh, isn't this great? Um, many waters, and as the voice of the great trumpet. Love the King James here. And I heard the voice... Um, of harpers harping with their harps. Now, I don't know what that means. I guess they're just playing a harp. So I guess when you harp on your harp, what are you going to say? You harp on your harp. I don't know what else to say about that. Majestic sounds. That's, that's what makes this so much. All this music going on. Heavenly music. And it probably sounded wonderful to John. Can you know, when you go back in chapter 8, you're silent in heaven for half an hour before tribulation starts. Can you imagine that? Here you have this great majestic sound. All this music going on. Majestic sounds in heaven, music in heaven, and all of a sudden silent for half an hour. Because the worst time in history is coming. And so they're silent, I believe. That's what the silent was. Because of the awfulness that was getting ready to come on earth. But it, anyway, here we are. So we see that music, and music is good. It's God's things. Now, in verse 3 it says, And they they sung. And we say they sang. That's just English, King James English. Sung. As it were a new song, before the throne and before the four beasts, living creatures, Zoah, 
Remember, we get that word from there. And the elders, and no man could learn the song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which had, were or been redeemed. Which have been, been redeemed or were redeemed. King James says there were been from the earth. Now it looks we're uh, here the new song, 144,000, they've been redeemed. It seems like these Jews, God has given a unique message um, in such that all the Jewish believers hear the message and believe, as in a day. I mean, uh, sometimes, somehow it's unique at the end of time. When they're preaching, like I say, millions, and you've got a whole remnant say We don't know what a remnant is. You just heard thousands and millions of us standing before the throne and have been washed and gave the life for Christ. But somehow this is a unique message, and it says that nobody else could do it but these 144,000. So God has done something different in their lives. He does something different in all of our lives when we ask Christ into our life, and he sends his spirit into our life and redeems us and he regenerates us. We get a different song in our heart. Even during this time, it's like, I sit down and I think about what's going on, and I have a peace. It's not anxiety. And it's it's not anxiousness. It just I told my wife the other day. I said, I said "Man, it's, it's just like a, a peace just rolled over me." You see, we got to put things in God's hand, and we got to see things through God's eyes and realize He's in control, and He's going to watch over us, just like the hundred forty-four thousand. He's going to watch over us. He's going to take care of us, whether it's in the rapture or whatever. If we go through some trials, He's going to give us the ability to go through these trials. He always does. We look and say, well, I cannot give my life up like those guys did over in the Middle East, getting their heads cut off. I think God gives us the, the courage to do that and the peace to do that when that time comes. He'll take care of us. We shouldn't worry about that. And then we go to verse 4. And these are they which were not defiled with women. They, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, wherever, wherever he goeth. These are the redeemed from among men, being the being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. Now, uh, there's all kinds of things. Of course, our human life and how we are and, we, and sexual beings we are. We can't do well. What do you mean without life? Well, hey, you know, Paul was told when he went to Gentiles, you're not going to have a wife. Supreme sacrifice. These 144,000 are going to make the supreme sacrifice. No children, not married, nothing. And a lot of people want to say, oh, that isn't, that can't be true or whatever. You know, I'm not going to argue with you this this stuff. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They said they are virgins. That means they're not married. They didn't defile their bodies with anything. So that's the way they are. And they're living that, that supreme sacrifice as, as Paul did, uh, not to have a wife. And these are they which are def which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever so he goeth. These, these were redeemed. From among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They don't get the first fruits. Um, Jesus is considered the first fruits, first fruits of the resurrection. Resurrection, there is only one resurrection. There's just different parts to the resurrection. Some believe that, that there's only one resurrection, it's all, all at the end. No, the rapture of the church is the resurrection because the dead are come up, and of course, at the end of white throne judgment, the dead and Christ. There's just, there, there's, there's one resurrection, there's just different parts from it. And Jesus was the first fruits, the church is the first fruits. These are the first fruits of the tribulation saints. Don't get it confused with the church age. It's not the church age uh, fruits, because we're already in heaven. These are the millions, the martyrs of tribulation, and God calls them the first fruits. They are the first fruits of the tribulation period, because the church is not here. So we see that. There's another thing that, that goes on. And in their mouths was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Blameless. Um, totally will never totally blame us. So I, I understand that. No, no gossip. Um, um, they just um, their mission was to tell every every Jew in the world and everybody about Christ. And yes, that He is the Son of God. Uh, they didn't talk about other people. They didn't talk about behind their back. They didn't judge. Uh, like today with Brad, he said he found a rock. And who are you going to throw the rock at? Remember the when Jesus they caught the lady in the in adultery, and they brought her out there, and Jesus said, Jesus was sitting down before they threw a rock, who, who, who among you um, really basically is sinless? None of them. And so none of them threw the stone at the woman. What are we throwing stones at people for? <laughs> we're just as bad as they are. Maybe we didn't murder anybody or stuff like that, but we're still bad. 
We got no right in throwing stones and judging people. And that's what he's saying. So all the, isn't it great? When it, boy, I tell you what, um, there gonna be a lot of people bored in heaven. I guess there won't be any gossip. No, I mean, <laughs> there's not going to go on in heaven anyway. I mean, uh, when the phone was invented, boy, gossip just threw everywhere. These cell phones of us, we can just spread everything. It, it doesn't mean. But there, there's no gossip. They didn't speak behind people's backs. They didn't do any judging of people. They didn't size them up, um, criticize them. Um, boy, that'd be nice if the church was like that today, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? Let me read verse 5 again. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now verse 6. Important verse. Here you go again. Here, here, here we see something. Uh, God's grace. And we see God's redemptive plan. God's redemptive plan doesn't stop at the church. It doesn't stop until he comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom. And even during that period, and at the end of it, people are going to make a choice for him or not. God's grace is still there. While he is ruling the world, he's still putting his grace out there for people to come to accept him. If not, read the last one. Satan's let loose and he tempts those that rebelled against him. But that's still God's grace. He's given them a thousand years to come to him. So we see it doesn't change. That's part of God's plan. All the way until we go into eternity. It's God's plan. Period. It's his redemptive plan. From the beginning of time, that is his redemption, the redemption plan, redemption, redemption plan. Okay, it doesn't end; it goes all the way from the Genesis to the end of Revelation. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and tongue and kindred. Now, the gospel is going to reach all the way in. We keep saying the gospel has got to reach the end of the earth. It's going to happen. It's going to happen during the, during the tribulation period. Angels are going to start preaching the everlasting gospel. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The grace of God. The ones who didn't believe the message of the 144,000 Moses and Elijah. God's grace comes out. The angels are going to preach to them. Because God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. He wants all to be redeemed. Or for anyone to stand before the throne and have, no, and have an excuse. Oh, you didn't let me know. No, that's not what it is. Everlasting gospel has been the same faith in God. Not doing things, not doing the Ten Commandments, having a meal, you could say it was the first Christians, whatever. It is the everlasting gospel. Christ will go to the cross in the past. Everlasting gospel. Um, let's look um, just for, I wasn't going to, I was thinking about not doing this, but let me go back to Acts 4.12. Um, and 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Faith has always been, you go to the faith chapter in Hebrews, everything had to deal with faith in God. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's where it is at. Every nation, always, every nation, every individual, every language. Uh, there's going to be nations. There's going to be nations around then. God doesn't throw nations away. Every kindred, every race, every tongue, language group, people, locations, everything. The whole gospel is going to go out. And what didn't listen to the 144,000, I'll say it again, the angels are going to preach that. Didn't listen to them or Moses and Elijah. Then the angels finally get involved to get the gospel message out. Whatever. So there's no excuse. Romans said there's no excuse. And there'll be no excuse. Stand there. The gospel will finally reach every individual. Now look at verse 7. And saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. Or what it means is about to come. That should be in there. Read it again. For the hour of his judgment is about to come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. You see, fear God. God is even going to the extremes of using fear. Now, I've heard people say they read, read Revelation and they got afraid and they accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Well, God is even going to use fear. Motions is not a good way, but God is even going to use that. 
last resort, he's trying every way he can to get people to believe because he doesn't want anyone to die. Not the best way, but if it will help people believe, I'll try even that. God says, I'll motivate that. No one to perish. Worship him. And John, I guess uh, most of us know all these scriptures. I'm not doing anything anything new. Um, where's John? John 1, 1, 3. We know it's the same one. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing, uh, anything made that was made. We're talking about Jesus Christ all in there. Um, I think there's... Um, Oh, Philippians, Colossians, is that right there? Colossians 1, 16. Uh, it says, um, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Talking about Jesus Christ, Hebrews um, 1, 10. Um, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hath made the fountains of foundations of the earth, and the heavens and all and are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou, rem, thou remainest, and they shall all wax old, and doth a garment. And see, God made everything. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ created everything, and we are to worship Him and Him alone. And only through him do we have salvation anyway. He is the only way. In verse 8, as we end this evening, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, Babylon. Religion, Babylon, uh, the end of time, okay, uh, the kingdom of Satan and his number has been called. It's ending. Babylon is talking about uh, a religion, false religion. At the end time, it is going to be destroyed. This ecumenical religion that Satan and the false prophet push on society. Ecumenical religion is going to fall. It has fallen. The end is here. Christ is coming back. The end of religion. And that's what's going to happen. And we'll end there. And just, uh, we'll, we'll pick up there. Maybe the next time. And we'll, we'll deal with some more passages in chapter 14. I think that's probably enough uh, tonight to look at, study. Uh, and things. To, uh, we need to get this message out. The church needs to start talking about it. Churches don't. Churches don't want to. I get excuses every time I bring stuff up like that or other people bring it up. Uh, they're just afraid to teach it or they don't want to make a stand. And the church needs to. We are to warn. And this is a warning. The prophets warned. Look at all the time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them warned that this was going to happen. Warn this stuff. Read really. Ezekiel, all of them. We're supposed to warn people. Not sit back and just let it go. That's part of the gospel message. is to warn what's going to happen in the end to wake people up, to wake the church up. It's the responsibility of the church and the pastors to teach this to the people. Father, again, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the time. Lord, we do thank you for the moisture that we are getting. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for your word, Father, and I know it's hard for people. Uh, sometimes it scares people. I know they don't want to hear it in a lot of cases, but Father, it needs to be done. The people need to have their eyes open. They need to see what's going on. Time is short. We do not know but, Lord, we do know it's coming. And so, Father, just pray that people open their eyes. Help them, Father, to acknowledge their sin before you, that they are separated from you, they don't belong in your family, and, Lord, that they need you. May they may they believe, Father, that you came here and human, took on human form, lived for 33 years, went to the cross of Calvary, died, you shed your blood, you died for the penalty of our sin, which is death. You rose on that third day to show us we will have a physical resurrection and new bodies. And Father, may we just, uh, we we confess that. And an individual Father out here that has not done that, may they do that, Father, and come to know you as their personal Savior. And Father, may they grow as Christians, 
Father, may we grow in your in your spirit. May we become more and more like you each and, and every day. Keep our eyes open. Help us to see the opportunities you give us to reach out to others. And Father, thank you. Thank you for the salvation that you have given us. Thank you, Father, that we are in the church age and we won't have to go through this. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I missed a few things.